a little bit, but let's go ahead and get started if that's okay. Don't want to run forever and forever into the day. Uh, let us pause and be in silent meditation for the thoughts of the day. Thank you. Um, the agenda today is going to be the economic forecast, revenue forecast, and then we'll take a short break and then do the Medicaid forecast and then go through the uh, projects that are on the agenda. Um, so we can hopefully maybe answer media questions after the revenue forecast. So with that being said, uh, any questions by we? Oh, introductions, members of committee, I need to do that. I'm Tim Brown, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee uh, from Crawfordsville, Indiana. Ben Tooley, senior fiscal analyst for the House Republicans. Zach Jackson, state budget director. Joe Habig, deputy budget director. Bob Cherry, alternate House Republicans. Matt Butler, House Republican Ways and Means staff. Uh, Liz Brown, Senator of District 15. Seth Hinchoff, fiscal analyst, Senate Republican Caucus. Senator Greg Taylor, uh, alternate Senate Democrats. Susan Preble, fiscal analyst for the Senate Democrat Caucus. Karen Talian um, for the Senate Democrat Caucus. Eric Gonzalez, House Democrat, fiscal analyst. Greg Porter, ranking member of Ways and Means, House Democrats. Chris Rivera, Senate Republican Fiscal Analyst. Thank you all for uh, being here on this important day. With that, we'll go into the meat of the economic forecast. Mr. Tom Jackson, uh, glad to see you're here. And uh, the floor is yours. Make sure the blue light is on so the internet can hear you uh, forever and ever. <coughs> Good morning. As always, uh, it's good to be here. I'll run through the uh, our, our view of the economic forecast, and you know, of course, uh, willing to answer uh, questions along the way, uh, you know, for clarification or otherwise. Uh, I intend to I intend to speak mostly about the state of Indiana, but uh, you know, always have to talk about things a bit in light of what we expect at the at the national level as well. Um, very similar to um, you know kind of what we've been thinking for a while now uh, we see u.s gdp growth overall averaging around two percent which is about um, where we see potential gdp growth uh, uh, particularly on the on kind of the supply side right now uh, kind of given where we are with population growth productivity growth that kind of thing uh, so that's uh, you know kind of running uh, you know, very similar to kind of the, the average over the last several years. Uh, we don't see too much, you know, at least on the horizon, moving us away from that for right now. Uh, consumer spending has been the big story. Consumer spending is the biggest uh, part of the economy and has been just uh, very, very strong, uh, or, you know, certainly solid, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, low unemployment, uh, you know, real wa wages, at least, uh, you know, steadily, gradually improving. Household wealth, I, th I think, is one that, that uh, we don't talk about maybe as, as much as we should, even though that doesn't always uh, translate into cash in consumer pockets kind of on a weekly basis. Uh, still an, an underlying factor, both in, you know, kind of kind of shorter term spending and, and particularly on uh, on bigger ticket items you know knowing that they have uh, you know some some assets to uh, to back that up and, and it helps with uh, uh, you know getting consumer credit and that kind of thing uh, capital spending uh, has been a little bit of a, of a weak point uh, you know and that can can generate uh, you know some of the demand for for manufacturing and that kind of thing we saw a, saw a boost uh, with the uh, tax cuts act uh, you know, with uh, you know, so it gave a, a somewhat of a boost in 2018, but 
Uh, you know, there's been some things uh, holding that up, uh, you know, some uncertainty over trade policy, uh, you know, oil and gas prices has been, you know, kind of a, a shift in our, in our national thinking in terms of oil prices, whether that's good or bad for the economy with uh, the resurgence of uh, U.S. oil production. Uh, you know, higher oil prices aren't, we don't view those as a bad thing. It's not strictly, you know, kind of a cost uh, the way we saw it for years. And then the issues with uh, 737 MAX, you know, that's one thing that in and of itself can, can move the needle a bit on, uh, uh, you know, just with that massive supply chain, can move the needle on the national level uh, in itself. Uh, we see inflation uh, staying very much in check. Uh, so that, and that's been the case for a good while. Uh, so just graph that out just, just briefly again. Uh, this is, is very similar to what we've been showing uh, for a good while, really, you know, a bit, uh, you know, the, the forecast over to the right. Just a, a tick down from where we were in, in 2017 and 2018, but back to more of what we've, what we've been expecting, and, and we expect to maintain that certainly over the next uh, uh, two or three years. And unemployment, you know, we've, we've uh, been struggling a little bit to figure out just how, how low unemployment can go um, without, you know, kind of causing problems with the economy. I think we're already past where we thought we could go. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess we're, we're learning in that regard. But that, that's partly due to just how, how unemployment is uh, calculated. Also, I won't uh, belabor that point. <laughs> uh, kind of changes in, uh, pardon me, let me back up one here. Changes from, from when we were here in April. I think, you know, one of the things was certainly in, in April, uh, recession risks were very much on really everyone's mind. Uh, uh, you know, I hope I didn't belab belabor that point in uh, April, but I know certainly that, that a lot of the um, a lot of media coverage and, and just, you know, really nationally recession uh, was was a concern. Uh, some things have, have happened to alleviate that. I think, uh, you know, consumer spending, consumer confidence has improved. I think uh, really the uh, uh, modest lowering of interest rates by the Federal Reserve uh, really gave a bit of a boost to the, to the housing market. Uh, we thought that might happen, but that's not always automatic. So I think uh, seeing a, a bit of a boost um, to the housing market certainly also improved confidence. Um, you know, I think in, in terms of, of the global economy, there's still a lot of risks out there. But if anything, I think we're, um, you know, at least gaining confidence or, or our fear is lessening that they will, you know, I, I guess we're just more confident that, uh, the both the U.S. economy and other economies uh, can can handle these risks. Uh, so so that's been a, a good thing. Um, Will manufacturing we see a, a trade pack with China in 2020. I'm I'm sorry. Will we see a trade pack with China in 2020? Sort of. <laughs> it, it's 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 hard to tell. Um, We've already been wrong about five times this year on that, and we're, we're not the only ones. Um, maybe a phase one, um, you know, with, with some agreement on, on agricultural purchases, um, putting off uh, some of the planned tariffs, some of the things we've already seen beyond that, we really don't know. Uh, I think our, our um, for, you know, kind of our default assumption on that is uh, that things will stay the way they are. That, that's what's baked into our forecast. It very much could go one way or the other. So um, one thing that, that certainly hit the, the state of Indiana uh, for a while was the, uh, the UAW strike uh, with General Motors certainly had a big impact in the, in the Fort Wayne area. We're very uh, cognizant of that. It was a six week shutdown. Uh, a lot of ways probably about as, as good as, uh, you know, as good an outcome as could have been expected uh, with that. Um, but we see the overall impact, you know, especially over the, over the course of several quarters, mostly being pretty, pretty neutral. I think with those, in, any time, there's a little bit of collateral damage that, that you don't recoup in terms of some of the, particularly even it, just some of the local businesses, even restaurants, things like that, that, you know, are located near the plant, that kind of thing. Some 
uh, you know, a little bit of spending gets dislocated. In terms of, of the workers themselves and suppliers, it uh, does look like a lot of that has been made whole. You know, they had a, a pretty substantial signing bonus, um, you know, when when uh, the, the, the pact was ratified. Uh, and, you know, if anything, we'll probably see some, uh, some overtime opportunities, particularly, you know, in things like truck plants. Uh, you know, given given the, the demand for that. So we see that as, as shifting uh, some of the income indicators among quarters, but but basically being being a wash. In terms of Indiana employment, payroll employment's come in a bit lower than, than we expected. Um, we and, and particularly in uh, you know some of the some of the lower lower wage uh, sectors like leisure and hospitality and retail. I, th I think part of that really is, um, you know, potentially something that we've kind of been expecting is that in, in some of those um, industries, they're, they're really, you know, having trouble finding workers. And again, you know, the, these aren't, you know, when we talk about payroll employment, we're not talking about full-time equivalents. We're talking about people on the payroll, uh, you know, kind of at any level. I, I think part of our suspicion is that this lower payroll employment headcount, so to speak, is, off, is being partly offset by uh, increased number of hours worked by the employees that you do have, um, you know, and, and higher wage rates. And, and so at, the way we look at uh, wages is average annual wages, which is both wage rates and uh, total hours worked. So, uh, you know, that can, that can make up for, for some things there. So, so we think that's at least part of what's going on. But then again, particularly at the retail level, we know there's still a lot of uh, dislocation going on there in, in terms of, you know, in some cases, some, some stores that have been in business for a long time going out of business, you know, being replaced by others, being displaced by demand for online shopping. Transportation and warehousing is one that, that really, uh, you know, I think that story there is partly coming off of, of um, really just some, a couple of really strong years is, is part of it. You know, manufacturing was going strong. That generates a lot of, a lot of demand for, for trucking and, and warehousing. Uh, a lot of the, the retail and a lot, a lot of the shift uh, in, in the logistics industry had, had translated into, um, you know, higher demand for, for transportation. <laughs> Uh, we do think that that some of the thing, and and this is this is a comment that that does hit both, uh, you know, transportation and, and manufacturing, as we look at what has happened and what we expect to happen. Uh, you know, I, I really do think that that part of what happened was we saw a shift in timing, uh, in in some economic activity, really due to the to the tariffs, uh, particularly the the China tariff situation that we we saw a run up, uh, in activity in uh, 2018, really kind of in anticipation of the tariffs, trying to get ahead of the tariffs, trying to get product. You know, you just, you, you just need, you need to get it in country. That's how it works. It doesn't matter when you ordered it. It doesn't matter when the product, you know, when the product you make gets sold, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, of going ahead and getting stuff, uh, you know, on shore. So, so we do think that that pulled had some activity that ended up being, you know, and they, they went ahead and, and did manufacturing, um, you know, w with some of the things. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that boosted, and, and that coincided in, in some cases with, uh, you know, some of the fiscal boost uh, that we saw from the Tax Cuts Act and in, in that, that we saw a lot of that in 2018. So some of what we're seeing now, uh, and, and we certainly saw that effect in, in a, a big run-up in business inventories in 2018, the first part of 2019. So we see some of this as just kind of a natural leveling out from that rather than, you know, we don't want to, you know, don't want to minimize it or, or, or totally ignore it, but we do think part of it is, is a timing issue that then will go away as some of these inventory issues uh, get settled out. So I want to, you know, that that's that's a, a, a big part of, I think, our, our story in terms of of how we see the the timing of the economic so forecast, so I want to make sure and and get that out there. Again, I think you know housing has improved a bit, not dramatically, but a bit, and and that uh, also provides some support. Uh, this this uh, graph we kind of look at all all the time, and very similar. The red line is uh, uh, 
state of Indiana. I, I didn't mean to favor Hoosiers with that. That was a little bit of a of a random uh, color choice. Uh, but you know, it, it's fairly fairly uh, typical of of what we've we've seen. Some of that is due to a bit lower population growth uh, in the state of Indiana relative to to the nation, uh, particularly southern and western states. So so that over time we are. We're certainly in a period now where we expect that to run a bit lower, um, you know. And there, there's some little quirks in the numbers, but overall, that's uh, kind of where we see things. Really, I think, really back in in April, we were, really were kind of expecting to see uh, that number, you know, drift just a bit below zero. But again, I think some of that is just where we are with uh, the employment situation, and we expect some uh, weakness to be offset by higher higher wages, also. And uh, on, a, on a related point, um, you know, I, I think one of the questions we get in terms of the wage outlook, you know, particularly since we have been waiting a while for uh, wage increases, if anything, you know, over, over the last few years, uh, admittedly, wages haven't always grown as quickly as we thought they would, um, you know, particularly with unemployment where it is. And, and we think part of that is we just need some improvement in, in productivity. Uh, you know, to to allow uh, uh, businesses to raise wa raise wages without triggering inflation, uh, you know. So and and that's key to you know. You can see short term wage gains, but if that triggers inflation, then that's going to be a little bit of a of a uh, short lived gain potentially. So we do see higher improve or higher productivity um, helping to boost wages uh, moving forward. In terms of economic indicators for, for Indiana, I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's a lot of a lot of numbers to to go through. Um, you know, some of that bottom line wage, wage income. See, uh, you know, holding fairly steady. I think as we get into 21 and 22, we do expect uh, the um, improvement in wage rates to kind of outweigh um, you know slower gains in in uh, payroll employment. You know, kind of headcount. Uh, to help help boost that a bit, and, and you know the the main story again there is just you know a solid underlying economy. Um, so that's you know housing starts a little better than uh, probably what we were looking at in, in April. I think that's partly due to due to Fed policy, uh, some and still just a lot of pent up demand there. Still we we know there's still a lot of re you know short supplies of housing, um, you know. Uh, demand out there for for more household uh, formation so we're, we're finally starting to see that translate into uh, some home building how come Just, personal income doesn't parallel wage income uh, that's that's because personal income includes uh, you know transfer payments uh, dividends income or dividends interest and in, in rental income that kind of thing uh, dividend that that DIR one can be fairly fairly volatile and have some uh, some things and, and to say, at, at times uh, transfer payments in particular can be counter cyclical with uh, waging Government yes yes um, yes yeah. can you just tell me what do you consider what number employment unemployment rate do you consider to be full? I know there's a, always a, a, a structural number that never goes away, but what's full? That's, that, that's uh, I mean, certainly, honestly, 3.1 is lower than we, we thought would be full. And, and you, can, you can run really beyond full employment for a little while. Um, it's it's very difficult to to, to pick a, a specific number. It's <laughs> it's a little bit more. I, I don't want to be you know glib at all, but it's a little bit. Uh, the answer is a little bit like well, we know it when we see it, or we saw it. I think, and that's just being realistic. I, I don't. Very close to it. Very close to it. And, and I think, as I said earlier, I think some of the uh, employment, you know, some of what we're seeing in in some of the particularly some of the lower wage. Um, uh, uh, sectors really kind of backs that up that, that it's, it's hard to to push that anymore it, it, you know re really much more because th those are the sectors where you don't run into as many issues with you know 
uh, you know, skills mismatch, you know, not having, you know, enough engineering degrees for, you know, engineering jobs, that kind of thing. So I uh, just wanted to talk, one, one thing that, that's probably changed a little bit too is, uh, you know, just kind of going over the last, last year or so, uh, we are seeing a little bit more of an even split between, uh, you know, sectors that are, that are gaining employment and sectors that, are, that are, are shedding jobs. Again, you know, leisure, leisure retail, kind of at, at the lower end, manufacturing. You know, so some of that, we, uh, certainly some of that we've, we've been expecting again. I think some of that's a bit of a, of, of a timing issue in terms of, you know, kind of coming off that, that run up that we saw over the last couple of years. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, health and social services is one that, that we know there uh, will be plenty of continued demand out there. Professional and business services, particularly on, on some of the higher, higher skilled, uh, higher wage uh, portion of that really doing uh, uh, really doing pretty well um, construction actually has been has been a bright point uh, we got kind of tired of being wrong on that one ex expecting gains in, in construction and not seeing it I think some of that is is some infrastructure spending that that just had to be done some of that is residential uh, you know commercial industrial really just kind of a very very broad based uh, uh, support there One one slide that I, I always see, apologize, I'm kind of waiting on the slide to catch up with me here. Uh, light vehicle sales, uh, clearly a, a big uh, demand factor. Again, this is at the U.S. level. I'm not talking uh, sales within the state of Indiana so much, just recognizing, uh, you know, the, the role that uh, U.S. sales play in uh, uh, demand for Indiana products, uh, particularly light trucks. Um, Again, it's you know really light vehicle sales. There there have been times when we've gotten nervous about this uh, outlook. I think uh, you know in in short terms, but still really very much hanging in there. Um, you know after such a big uh, run up that we've seen after the recession, I think we do feel like you know certainly consumer incomes um, still supportive of uh, automotive demand. Uh, low uh, low gasoline you know sustained and expected continued low gasoline prices are helping uh, uh, pick up trucks SUVs that kind of thing uh, and now we're starting to get you know more into as as uh, you know the the early part of that uh, run-up in vehicle demand was long enough ago that, that you're seeing some replacement demand now you know those uh, cars getting old enough that, that people want to replace them so we see that as being supportive of, uh, but you know, not not a lot of potential growth, kind of from where we are overall. I think the next one I I snuck in there twice. I apologize for that. So the good news is that's uh, one uh, one less slide you'll you'll need to look. Well, it, it's a little bit different, but basically saying the same thing. Kind of the the components of higher wages. So uh, it was clearly on my mind as I was. Uh, Putting putting this together, uh, again talk about uh, the housing market. Go back to that just briefly. I think it's we're far enough along that I probably should stop uh, showing the housing starts uh, pre-recession. Uh, I've always kind of do that just to provide a little context, but um, really probably need to focus more just on on where we are and and what we think is a realistic running rate. That's kind of. One thing I always point out is we don't necessarily want to get back to where we were uh, in the early uh, mid 2000s on, on housing anyway. That was, uh, you know, kind of wound up with a, a different set of problems there when you uh, tweak that too much. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, want to get that up there both in terms of, you know, that, that boosts the economy and then, you know, housing affordability, uh, certainly an issue um, that, uh, you know, even even in uh, even in the Midwest, you know, starting to catch up with some other areas and, and being a concern in some places. Uh, but you know, we see kind of where we are as as being a pretty realistic uh, running rate for a while now. Um, so I'll just leave that at that for now. Talk a little bit about how the uh, forecast has evolved. This is one we always talk about. Uh, just moving forward, I guess one thing, um, 
you know, that was a bit of a topic of conversation back in April, so I highlighted it a little bit, was that red number was a, a decline in, and, and again, and at this point, that's, that was a BEA estimate of historic data that was uh, dropped a bit, and, and that uh, caused us to need to um, pull down income a little bit. And that, that number, that revision was since reversed, and uh, so, so that came in a bit better, but that's partly offset. You know, probably over the course of a couple of years, those, those, that revision is offset then by a little bit lower in growth in 2019, but uh, point that out as, as kind of one of the challenges. Senator Taylor, did you have a question? I did. I can, I can wait. I think it's going to get to the slide. Okay. Uh, Okay. Okay, I'll just uh, go quickly to uh, kind of a, what I call the bottom line for, for Indiana, uh, sum, sum this up. Um, again, we see economic, remaining, economic growth remaining steady, probably not a lot of upside potential from, from where we are or what we're seeing. Um, you know, the risks are, are kind of the usual risks. I think, you know, with where we are in the uh, recovery, you know, within the economic cycle, uh, the, the risks are going to be more to the downside. That's just uh, pretty common for, for this, this stage of the, of the cycle. Um, you know, certainly one of the things that, that we point out very much that's doing very well in the state of Indiana, the professional, scientific, and technical uh, businesses, um, you know, that's, you know, and I say including high tech, but that's not only, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about high tech, but certainly other other uh, you know professional sectors uh, overall doing well. Uh, you know healthcare is going to continue to see a lot of a lot of demand. Uh, you know manufacturing employment uh, we see turning modestly and I and I do emphasize modestly negative uh, over the next few years. Uh, you know partly due to that uh, vehicle uh, demand situation, but but still relatively supportive. Uh, Home building again, we see being pretty uh, pretty steady, uh, you know, and overall supportive. Uh, but then, uh, you know, in terms of of uh, longer term growth, you know, certainly continued growth in the labor force is, is a big uh, big factor moving forward. Senator Taylor, do you have a question? Oh yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm yeah. Senator Taylor. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, under the category for housing affordability as a factor in economic competitive with other states. Can you explain what you mean by that? And I think I understand, but I want to make sure that I have my uh, thoughts in the proper place here. Well, I think uh, part of the idea, uh, particularly, uh, you know, for a state like Indiana that has relatively, you know, a bit lower population growth th than some areas, part of the expectation and, you know, Part of part of what is is seen as a potential attra uh, attractiveness for Indiana, particularly relative to coastal cities, but potentially anywhere, is you know your your wage rate potential wage is one thing, but then you know cost of living is going to be another. So that that's part of it, and and I think the other part also is um, you know just being able to keep the the people you have really in in um, in. Uh, the jobs at, at all levels. It sounds like to me what you're saying is the cost of living in these communities is rising at a higher pace than their wages, which would in turn develop a scenario where housing would be less of an incentive because of their lack of ability to pay, for example, a, a mortgage rather than some other. Is that what you're saying, that we've, while the economy is booming, the wage rate has not caught up with the cost of living changes? I, I think that's part of it. I, I think, you know, an, another part is um, just really the lack of, of home building that we've seen, really extending back 10 years now. Um, you know, really for, for several years, we really had expected um, home building to increase both increase more rapidly than it did coming out of coming out of the recession and then you know really kind of kind of reach higher levels um, 
you know, largely, largely due to demand, and we haven't seen that to the extent yeah. that we expect. And I think so we have some opportunities, Mr. Chairman, under the next in the next session, legislative session. We've been talking about the utilization of some of our underutilized tax credits to incentivize building in communities to create affordability. I hope we take that up as an issue because we know <coughs> even from our own forecast that uh, the wages are not keeping up with the rates of inflation and therefore the government's going to have to do something to incentivize these communities to have homes. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. I just wanted to make sure we were thinking on this along the same lines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Porter, you have a question? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman, if I may, please. Uh, Tom, um, on slide number seven, I'm, I'm going to go back to your key economic indicators for Indiana. Uh, unemployment rate, um, this just jumped in you know, 2019, is 3.4, and it seems everyone talks about the unemployment rate with our, within our state as well as the wage income. Have you, I know you do more national, but is there, have you ever looked at, or have we ever asked to look at, disaggregate that data to minorities or people in certain uh, age ranges in regards to the unemployment rate and, and wage rate? Uh, because to me, uh, when I look and uh, at certain parts of Indiana or Indianapolis, where I'm from, uh, the unemployment rate is double digit, uh, but it, it's never reflected here. And it looks like everything is 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 pure as is is the cold is outside. Uh, and I'm, I just want to: Did you ever consider that? Is that something you do nationally, or or what? I just unpack that for me, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We we only break down, and especially in terms of our forecast, we just break down unemployment rates. We do that at, say, an MSA level, uh, which still doesn't get to, uh, you know, the, the, the granularity that you're talking about. So we really would look at, for example, the Indianapolis MSA as a whole, and, and that's, um, you know, pretty, pretty broad. Yeah, and that's, that's certainly, well, I, th I think there's, there's two a aspects uh, to that question. One is, uh, you know, whether the unemployment rate is picking that up, and another issue that that makes the unemployment rate problematic at times is that sometimes that doesn't even tell the full story because that's only counting people who are officially included in the labor force. So then there can be other folks, you know, certainly of, of working age, um, who are not considered in the in the in the labor force. So so that doesn't get counted. But I'm sorry, the, the short answer to your question is is no, we don't we don't account for that directly in our in our forecasting so mr chairman so that that's telling me that even though we we have a rosy uh picture that there's there there's a lot of thorns in there because they're not being counted yeah yeah there's certainly i mean any any unemployment rate higher than literally zero means that yeah there are there are people uh without work and you know certainly the um uh, you know, the higher rates that, that you're talking about in, in certain areas. Yeah, yeah, we recognize that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then just to follow up on that, so when you said if they're no longer looking, is that what you said? And so how, what is the determination? I've always been curious because we're close to full employment right now, but in, and there are obviously you can't find a business that isn't hiring, hoping to hire at all wage levels. But what, who determines that they're no longer looking when they're able-bodied and not, do not have a job? That, that's a good question. That, um, the Department of Commerce's uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics has a definition of that. Of course, this is all survey-based. Um, you know, I think it's you know, a fairly specific definition of you know, lo actively looking for employment. I think there there are some things. I'm, I'm not real familiar with the mechanics of it, but you know, basically some proof that you know. I don't know whether it's that you've applied for for you know a certain amount of jobs within a certain time frame, but I think you know that there is, and and I think they they you know kind of take people's word for it. you know there could be some respondent, uh, uh, you know whether it's 
bias or, you know, maybe people, different people reading the question differently, but it's a specific question, are you actively looking for a job? And, and if someone says no, then they don't get counted in uh, as part of the labor force. Right. So that doesn't mean that they couldn't get a job, but they're right. not actively looking. It doesn't mean they're on an employment insur yes. insurance as well looking for yeah. a job. It just means they may not be interested. Is that right? Yes. And, and do we keep track, um, and, and I, it's not in your indicators, I know, but do we also sort of track the number of job openings and in the wage scale that is available to them? Because I'm amazed uh, whether it's manufacturing in my district or your typical retail at this time of year, how many employers are desperately seeking someone. No, we don't. We don't. I, it's it's something that that we're aware of, and and we we um, certainly consider that more on, on an anecdotal basis. Um, you know, and and this recovery in particular has been you know, kind of difficult to, to call certainly labor force participation. You know, that's a, another thing that we look at is just, you know, broader measures of, you know, how many people are there, you know, how many working age, you know, what's the working age population versus the, the official labor force. Um, you know, then, then certainly I, you know, in, in a way I always hate to bring this up, you know, part of the problem that we're seeing in very much of the country in, um, in, 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 uh, many different industries, especially anything running equipment, is things like being able to pass a drug test, uh, that kind of stuff. And I know I, <laughs> I grew up on a farm and, uh, you know, I couldn't drive a tractor, uh, uh, you know, uh, under, under influence of anything. And, and uh, so at least from what I hear, that, that is one problem. Uh, but certainly not, certainly not the only one. But that's not really measured either then. So your point is, is that there, there are those out there who may not be holding a job, but they are not capable, if that's the case, because they passed, they failed a drug test or something, mm -hmm. or at least currently, they haven't been able to get past that first hurdle mm -hmm. because of that, yeah. so, something like that. I have a, another quick question about the housing. When you talked about housing starts, and it looked like it was <clears throat> slowing down maybe just a tad, I was just curious, or anticipating, or well, maybe just a leveling off, I guess, but I was just curious, that doesn't track, because um, we have a lot going on in Allen County where I'm from, a lot of uh, new housing developments, but it also, does that track open housing that's available? Because there seems to be a shift in my area from the urban core. So there are homes that are available, but not as much interest in those as in these newer areas. So does it track available housing or just new starts? No, th this is, is housing starts. Now, we do have a component, and it's partly a data issue in terms of, you know, kind of the housing stocks, um, you know, and, you know, that, that's that been a question that where maybe we've wondered if we've, if we're not fully accounting for, yeah, the availability of housing uh, in, in some areas. Uh, that, and that's particularly true in, in a, you know, Detroit is kind of an extreme example of places where you have a lot of vacancies uh, just because so many people moved out. Uh, certainly doesn't apply everywhere. Uh, but no, it, it, we have some notion of housing stocks. Again, that's more at an MSA level, not necessarily granular enough to really um, do a lot of, you know, have, have too much bearing on our forecast. That, that's really the end of my um, prepared comments. Uh, I, I have, I'll, 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 I'll say what I always say, that I have a bunch of U.S. slides toward the end that I'm happy to go through, but usually the answer is no thank you. But uh, Wasn't it in December or April you put about 50% uh, recession risk in 2020? It wasn't that high. I think it was probably 35%. Okay. And Has that changed nationally? Um, it's, it's about the same. I think the, the potential timing got shifted back a little bit. Um, honestly, th th I think that that's mostly a measure of, you know, kind of weighing upside versus downside risk. Certainly from where we are, there, there's, there is more downside risk. Uh, than upside is partly just because of where we are in the economic cycle that we don't think there's a lot of room to grow uh, without some outside stimulus that 
it's hard for us to see what that would be. Um, so from that standpoint, we see more downside risk. I mean, you talk about a modestly negative manufacturing, and Indiana per capita is one of the highest ma per capita manufacturing states in the country. Hmm. Does that mean we're going to be modestly negative over the short term? Well, I, I, I will point out again that, that we think some of that is, I, I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, in terms of manufacturing employment, again, I think, you know, we have some other things in terms of, uh, you know, productivity growth and, and that kind of thing that will keep output, uh, you know, fairly strong. Uh, and that's one thing. And another, again, I'll point out that, that some of the, you know, particularly the really short-term comparisons are coming off of a relatively uh, strong base. Uh, one example is, uh, uh, well, certainly, you know, one, one is autos, another is semi-trucks. Um, you know, and, you know, regardless of how many semi-trucks are, are manufactured, you know, I know Cummins sells a lot of engines uh, for semis, for example. Um, you know, and that's one where where the trucking industry just, you know, blew up to, uh, you know, in a, in a good way. Uh, you know, really took off a couple of years ago. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of, of demand for new trucks for various reasons. Uh, partly because, you know, even relatively good trucks were being replaced by trucks with automatic transmissions um, in order to try to widen the, broaden the labor pool. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that back order or, you know, a lot of that backlog has been worked through. We don't see that as a huge, you know, red flag. You know, oh, no one's buying trucks anymore. I think part of it is, you know, uh, more of a, you know, just coming coming down off of a, a very high level and things do need to level out a little bit. And isn't government getting in the way a little bit of the low income wage earner because some of the benefits you can get by being on government programs aren't high enough to take you off? That's that that's that's certainly one potential issue, yes. Um, you know, and you know, with, with some employers, even things like you know having a certain number of hours worked, um, you know, in terms of providing benefits, uh, that kind of thing, you know, it can provide some incentive for for employers to limit you know the number of hours per worker. Yeah, yeah, there are certainly some uh, you know I guess what we call them perverse incentives. Uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, of of allowing further further growth. Thank you. Senator Taylor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you didn't get to the slide, so I'll just slide 16. Oh, okay. Um, from an economic standpoint, looking at the indicators, the federal fund rate, as well as the 10 year Treasury, as the economic indicators, you've got 2020, the federal funds rate going down almost 60 basis points. Does that lead for good credits to have lower interest rates on their debt? Depends on the structure of the debt. I think, you know, in terms of offering, you know, new loans um, on balance, yes, that doesn't get fully Okay. Transmitted, and and I think that's part of part of what we're seeing is yeah. And and in most cases, aren't the debts associated with the with the a combination of the U.S. Treasury as well as the federal the, the reserve rate that we that we have that 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 the that's actually in the market, if you will. The, the federal funds rate would, would be more, you know, targeted to, um, you know, interest for, you know, kind of newly, newly created credit. Okay. So you've got federal fund rate going down. If you were in the market to borrow, and your forecast would say that 2020, that rate is going to go down, wouldn't that mean that if you're going to borrow, next year would be the great year to do it? If your economic forecast is correct, yeah, yeah, I mean it. Okay. It, um, yeah, I mean it, it depends on other factors, but yeah, certainly that, uh, that and that and that's part of. Part and of this question motivation. is is 
kind of, and you may not be able to answer, but I, I would imagine the state budget director, our reserves that we have are invested. And I would, I would, I would assume, without doing a FOIA request, that they're invested in treasuries, something secure. Um, the 10-year treasury rate being at 2%, and the federal fund rate being forecast at 1.6, it would be better to have the cat. You would get a greater return to have the cash and to borrow, because you're going to yield a 2% treasury on your cash, and you're going to borrow at less than 2%, I would assume, if you have a good credit. Just wanted to make sure that I'm on the right line. And, and, and either one can answer that question. I'll defer to the other Mr. Jackson on this. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle. Uncle. Um, I, uh, I think what you're saying, I, I don't have anything to disagree with that. I would say, though, that um, I, I'm definitely not the best expert to, to, to even um, kind of push back, I, I think we could set up something with the treasurer's office. I mean, they are the ones that do all of the investments for the state. It's not run by the budget agency at all. But as a budget agency, isn't it your job to be able to forecast and provide the best economic outcome for the state taxpayer dollars that you have to serve? I mean, your, your actual duty, I would imagine, to do that. And it seems to me all I'm asking you, if that foundation is there, even based on our own economic forecast. I, I, I think it's a great conversation we should have. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate all the information. Welcome back to the Midwest. Next, we'll go to Hari and uh, Ben with the revenue forecast information. that's something I'm constantly whispering to you so um, <laughs> good morning mr. chairman members of the committee uh, my name is Ben Tooley and I'm the director of fiscal policy for the House Republican caucus seated next to me is Hari Raza from Dramanana Hari is the assistant director of revenue at the state budget agency so now that you've received the economic forecast uh, from mr. Jackson Hari and I are here to present you with a new revenue forecast for fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021. But first, before we go into the numbers, I want to say just a few quick words about the revenue forecast technical committee, its members and staff. So let's go to the next slide. The charge of the technical committee is to select the equations used in the revenue forecast. Those equations are matched up with the economic variables projected by our economic forecasting consultant, who you just heard from, to predict future general fund tax revenues. The committee is a six-member bipartisan committee, and like the budget committee itself, is a collaborative effort between the legislative and the executive branches. Most importantly, and I think this is key, especially when you look at other states uh, nationally and the situations they have when it comes to revenue forecasting, our revenue forecast in Indiana is a consensus forecast. That means that all the members of the committee, who I'm going to, who are on the screen up here, uh, agree that what we present to you today is our very best effort at projecting the amount of general fund tax revenue that the state will collect the remainder of this fiscal year and next. 
So aside from Hari and myself, uh, the other members of the committee are Eric Gonzalez, fiscal analyst for the House Democrats, Susan Preble, fiscal analyst for the Senate Democrats, Krista Rivera, senior fiscal analyst for the Senate Republicans, and I don't think she is here, I didn't see her, but uh, probably watching online, Dr. Dagny Falk, who is the committee's independent economist. She's from the Miller College of Business at Ball State University. And uh, just want to say that we are very thankful that Dr. Falk has agreed to step into the committee member role. Um, it was, of course, made vacant by the recent passing of Dr. John Mikesell. Uh, Dr. Mikesell served this committee faithfully for over 30 years and, and was just really a renowned international internationally known expert on, on revenue streams. So we definitely miss him a lot, but we're very glad to have Dr. Falk. Um, she is not completely new to the process. She has actually served on the committee uh, in an advisory capacity since 2016. So she had a, had a bit of a lead up period to join the committee. And then finally, the last thing I wanna do is just give a special thank you to the staff at the State Budget Agency and the Legislative Services Agency they contribute a considerable amount of time uh, to this process and uh, their uh, talents are extraordinary and we really couldn't do it without them. So let's go on. Okay, so moving on to slide three in your packet, this slide shows how revenues have been performing for the first five months of the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2020, and it compares it to the April 2019 forecast target the budget plan forecast, and I'll go into that a little more later, and then FY 2019, the exact same period, so the same five months in fiscal year 2019. Um, so the slide shows the total revenues are currently outpacing budget plan targets by about 3.3%, and the same period in FY 19 by about 36 overall. And I will mention that the three uh, independent or uh, specific taxes mentioned on this slide, we've often referred to them as the big three, sales, individual, income, and corporate. They account for about 91% of our forecasted revenue, and it is great news that they are performing above targets and better than in fiscal year 2019. Slide four gives you a, up, oh, sir. Uh, going back to that slide, which one is the highest contributor? I'm sorry, which one? Oh, it's the sales tax. It's okay, about 49% of our overall revenue. And then next would be? Individual income tax, it's probably about 37% okay. of the overall, and then corporate is five. Gotcha. Yeah, about five. Right. So that okay. just shows you everything else is pretty small when the big three includes one that's 5%. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so slide four uh, gives you a high-level overview of the economic factors that we feel influence uh, general fund revenue collections. I'm not going to dwell on this slide because you just heard from our economic uh, forecasting consultant, but suffice it to say that the broad economic trends that are outlined here are driving the overall direction of the revenue forecast. Slide five lists some of the major tax policy factors that impact the revenue forecast. So please keep in mind that um, our revenue projection models generally forecast the tax base, which is independent of the tax rate and the way in which collected revenues are ultimately distributed. So after the tax base is forecasted, the actual amount of revenue that finds its way to the general fund is gonna be dependent on A, the tax rate, and B, the way in which the funds are distributed statutorily once collected. So as you can see from the slide, the general fund forecast for fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021, uh, that forecast is impacted by a handful of significant tax policy changes, most notably uh, and recently the uh, marketplace facilitator tax compliance legislation that was enacted as part of House Bill 1001 this past session and also by continued reductions in the individual income tax rate, um, which I think most of the, uh, I'm sorry, the corporate income tax rate, my bad, I'm sorry, and uh, the uh, uh, financial institutions tax rate as well. So those were put into place uh, a handful of years back and they're phased in over time. On the distribution side, House Enrolled Act 1001 from 2016 and House Enrolled Act 1002 from 2017 made changes to the way in which gasoline use tax revenues, uh, or GUT, we call it GUT for short, uh, revenues are distributed. 
and that will have an ongoing impact on the general fund, and this chart shows the impact through 2021, but the impact will continue through 2025, and ultimately, um, you know, those revenues are all going to end up in road funding programs. That was the, the, the plan under House Rolled Act 1002. So I think we can go to the next one. Okay, so moving on to the models, slide six lays out the variables that comprise the models used to project the sales tax, the individual income tax, and the corporate adjusted gross income tax. The sales tax forecast is actually made up of two distinct models. Uh, the first is the gasoline use tax model, which you can see on the top of that upper left-hand box. Um, that model has not changed since April, so it's the same the same model. Of course, Hari, correct me if I say anything wrong, especially on the models. Um, the second uh, part of that uh, forecast is a model that we use to estimate the sales tax net of gut revenues. So uh, the model we use to project those other sales tax revenues uh, was altered by the committee, and we did it in two different ways this uh, particular uh, time around. First, the committee removed the variable that captured Indiana personal consumption expenditures on goods and services. And I, I think the concept behind that variable was sound in that it was designed to capture the shift in consumer preferences for services, which are typically non-taxable, in lieu of goods, which are generally, for the most part, taxable. However, the variable ultimately did not add very much to the accuracy of the model, and so uh, it wasn't included this time around. And then second, the committee replaced the variable that captured prior fiscal year mortgage rates with a prior fiscal year home sales variable. The idea behind both, both variables is generally the same. Home sales drive direct consumer spending on things like appliances and furnishings, things like that, and they're also indicative of consumer confidence. But the committee concluded that a variable that was specific to the actual home sales, which is really at the end of the day what we're trying to, trying to capture, uh, was a more direct way of capturing this dynamic. And then the other models on the sheet, the, the three distinct models that we use to forecast the individual income tax, and then the model for the corporate adjusted gross income tax, uh, we basically didn't change those models. I, I think we did remove an extra pay period variable from the withholdings model but I think that might have been just, just a, more of a timing thing with, uh, with how the years shake out in terms of pay periods. Any questions on the models? Go ahead, Ari, yes, please. Uh, I want to add that due to uh, the several uh, legislative changes that have happened both at, in Indiana at the national level, the models try to capture the dynamics separately for things like marketplace facilitator and the tax cuts and jobs act so the models try to forecast things separate of those impact and then we also have a forecast for how much additional dollars are uh, will be generated from those other impacts i think that's a perfect segue over to the next slide and hari described it Perfectly. Uh, there are things that are part of the forecast that really can't be captured by the models or it's very difficult to because uh, they're either recently enacted legislative acts and so there's no history in the data sets that we use when you go back over time um, or they could be just some kind of unique or one-off circumstance that really doesn't lend itself well to the model. And so, um, you know, on this slide the examples are two things. I'll give you the sales tax examples here. Um, Two of the major adjustments, marketplace facilitator uh, legislation, which I already mentioned, and then the impact of the Wayfair Supreme Court decision, which started to be started to impact Indiana sales tax collections in the second quarter of fiscal year 2019. Um, and so we made those adjustments, as Hari said, and, and uh, for those two particular adjustments, we have the benefit now. We didn't have necessarily the same benefit in April but we have the benefit of actual collection experience from the Department of Revenue. And so we can look and see what's actually coming in, and that gives us a much, uh, much better idea of what those, uh, those adjustments should be, and I think we feel much more confident in them uh, than even in April when we just weren't 100% weren't sure how it was going to shake out. So this next slide, um, the purpose of including this slide is just to really give you a visual 
and it, I'm sorry, it's kind of the top color is kind of hard to see on the TV screen up there. It's darker on our computer. Um, but it's really meant to give you a visual representation about how three major tax uh, policy changes have impacted the sales tax forecast. Um, and it also helps you to put those impacts uh, into context with the context with the overall uh, sales tax collection. So if you look at that chart, you'll see the black line is uh, representing the gasoline use tax distributions to the general fund. And you can see that that declines over time as those funds are shifted uh, over into various road funding accounts. And then the gold, I guess gold colored uh, line just above it is the impact of the Wayfair decision. And also we did have some legislation in state law that made it so that we could uh, enforce those provisions once we were allowed to at the federal level. And you can see the, you know, the impact really isn't all that big. And I think, I think what's interesting about that is Indiana was already collecting quite a bit of remote sales tax from, for example, Walmart or Target. They're already here in the state. They were paying sales tax on their remote sales. Uh, we also had Amazon. Amazon is the giant in the industry, and uh, there is uh, an agreement for them to collect sales tax on uh, products that they were selling directly through Amazon. So the next line above it, which is probably a little more clear on your handout, is the impact of marketplace facilitators. That's companies like eBay, Etsy, Airbnb, and even Amazon's marketplace business. Uh, those revenues are predicted to be significantly larger than Wayfair revenues, and we just started to see those revenues hit the uh, state revenue streams this fiscal year. So they, the law went into effect July 1st. We're just now starting to see the revenue. And in total, those adjustments are, when you add them together for Wayfair and Marketplace, that's about $300 million in fiscal year 2021. Um, that is a significant amount of money, but Part of the reason of showing you this slide is just to keep it in context that together uh, that's about 3.5 percent of all sales tax collections. So it's still a relatively small piece of the base, but it's important because clearly it's, it's growing year over year. Okay. So let's go on to the results. Slide 10 shows the new revenue projections for the sales tax, the individual income tax, and the corporate income tax and compare, compares those projections to both the prior year, so actual revenue collected in 19 or forecasted revenue in 20, uh, and also compares uh, those uh, numbers to what was projected in the April 2019 forecast. So I wanna call your attention to a few key takeaways. So first, you will see that the forecast for sales tax collections, A, has been increased by 129 million in fiscal year 2020, and 183 million in fiscal year 2021 as compared to the April forecast, and B, that the tax is expected to grow annually by 3.7% in fiscal year 20 and 3.1% in 2021. But I do wanna say it's important to recognize that much of this projected growth is driven by the marketplace facilitator tax compliance legislation. And um, of course, the fiscal impact of that legislation could not be incorporated into the April forecast because we did that forecast on April 17th of 2019, and the law had not yet been enacted by the General Assembly. And that, that's a very common, common thing. We always want to make sure we have a forecast available for the budget decision makers so that they can go into the final negotiations. But we know full well there's going to be other provisions. Um, that are out there that are going to impact our state revenues. And so we attempt to estimate those the best we can, um, but it's not part of the formal April forecast. So I make this point because I want to place it, uh, the sales tax forecast, uh, into better context for the members of the, this committee. And um, I will further illustrate more on this point in a later, later slide. So... The second thing I wanted to point out on this slide is that while the overall corporate tax forecast, which is actually made up of several different components, we've got the corporate AGI tax, you have the utility receipts tax, and then you have the financial institutions tax, we call it FIT for short, that is projected to decline in fiscal year 20 as compared to fiscal year 2019. But a big reason behind this decline is the result of uh, there were some reconciliations done by the Department of Revenue on old FIT payments. And so 
what ultimately happened because they did these old reconciliations we ended up collecting basically twice as much FIT revenue in fiscal year 19 versus the historical average historically we generally collect about 60 million a year and we collected 120 well that was a one-time deal uh, the forecast projects that um, we're going to go back to the historical norm of somewhere between 50 and 60 million dollars a year so that has an impact on that year-over-year -year decline and it does offset what is actually, if you look at just the corporate AGI, there is, a, there is an increase in the corporate uh, AGI tax collections that are projected in this forecast. They're just outweighed by the, that change, one-time change in the FIT. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Sure, please do. Uh, I also wanted to add that uh, those numbers should, should be interpreted within the context of how we performed in 2019. If you remember fiscal year 2019, all the big three revenue streams outperformed forecast, uh, sales tax did, individual and corporate. And that echoes a lot of what has been said about what happened in, with the 2018 economy and wages and personal income came in higher than expected, which really had a positive impact on our uh, general fund revenues. So a lot of the increases that, that you see there are a combination of fiscal year 2019 economic momentum and really tax revenue, and then the impact of incorporating legislative uh, changes. Good. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So slide 11 is, is very similar to the previous slide, except it shows the gaming taxes and then what we call the other taxes category, which has a variety of different elements to it. Um, one thing to point out here is gaming taxes as a whole are expected to grow in both fiscal years. Part of it is racinos are growing a little bit faster, and uh, I think Riverboat may be actually expected to decrease slightly in fiscal year 20, but the bottom line is this is a welcome reversal of recent trends. If you look at historical gaming taxes, there's been quite a drop off uh, since fiscal year 11, and this is good news to see that level off and uh, actually increase a little bit overall. But I do want to, again, point out, um, I just alluded to it, but when you look at the gaming tax forecast, uh, there were some outside acts that were enacted after April. Uh, after the April forecast, um, most notably House Enrolled Act 1015, which authorized table games at the Racinos. That's effective January 1st of next year, so that's upping our forecast. Um, and uh, also there were some uh, uh, fees for relocating casino licenses that factor into this as well. So that's the, like with anything, I think what you're hearing from me is you got to be careful interpreting any numbers because there's always there's always a caveat there that you need to understand to get the context so finally the last last piece is the total forecast for fiscal year 20 and 2021 uh, overall you can see that revenue is expected to grow by 2.3 percent in fiscal year 2020 and 2.8 percent in fiscal year 2021 as compared to fy 2020 uh, you will note that uh, in total the committee has increased revenue projections as compared to the April forecast by 239 million in FY 2020 and 292 million in FY 2021. However, uh, we're going to get to the next slide here in a second, but what it demonstrates is that a significant portion of the difference between April and December is attributable to revenue prov provisions that were enacted after the April forecast, but before the end of the session. So one of the benefits we have in the December forecast is that we're able to see all these revenue provisions that were enacted at the end of uh, the session and actually incorporate them into the December forecast. So it's, it's basically what it comes down to is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at numbers, but if your question is, and for this committee, I think it's an important question, if your question is, how does this new forecast impact the state budget, then a direct comparison of the April forecast and the December forecast is not really going to answer that question. You have to also take into account the estimated impact of outside acts that were enacted in 2019 and were um, taken into account as the budget was finalized. So let's, I guess we're already on the last slide here. So 
Slide 12, uh, the intent is to help you guys, and sometimes I hear this, uh, these folks <laughs> referred to as budgeteers. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard that, but trying to help you budgeteers uh, evaluate the impact that the forecast has on the current biennial budget. So as you're aware, the amount of projected tax revenue upon which the budget is built is, in actuality, it's the sum of the April forecast and the estimated net general fund impact, positive or negative, of all tax revenue provisions enacted during the budget session that were not otherwise incorporated into the forecast, the April forecast. So the April forecast, as adjusted by the fiscal impact of these other revenue acts, is commonly referred to as the budget plan forecast. And that forecast is a pretty important marker in evaluating the overall revenue performance in the interim between the end of a budget session and the December forecast released later that same year. So all that's to say is that the Revenue Forecast Committee uh, understands the important of this dis importance of this distinction to this committee in particular. And so for the first forecast after each budget session, um, it has been our practice to provide the committee a table just like this one. I think if you've been on the committee for the last six or seven years, you've seen this table a few times. Um, that helps you reconcile from the April forecast to the budget plan forecast, which is what would have been taken into account at the end of session, to the December 2019 forecast that you're seeing today. So as this table shows, the revenue provisions that were not incorporated into the April forecast added about $115 million in 2019 as estimated at the time and $156 million in fiscal year 2021. And that, of course, added to what the April forecast projected. So when you look at that in that context, if you're looking at what is the difference between the budget plan and the December 2019 forecast, if you look at the uh, second column from the right, you'll see that the difference is about $124 million in fiscal year 2020 and 135.7, 136 million fiscal year 2021, and that equates to about a 0.8% increase over the biennium uh, in anticipated revenue. So if you wanna look at this a little bit further, we didn't include these slides in the main body, but you can go to the appendix and we have some slides that compare by major tax type the uh, different tax revenues as compared to the budget plan forecast. But um, I'm not gonna go over them here, but if you wanna look in your packet, you can see them on slides 13, 15, and 16. So the last thing I wanna show you is just slide 13. Um, sure you're familiar with that. That's all the data I just gave you, but in a single convenient chart that is also probably really difficult to read. But I promise all of the all of the things you'll want to know, know all the comparisons they're all they're all in this uh, this chart. So as I said, the remainder of the packet includes some other additional slides that you can review at your leisure. Um, some good information in there about the economic variables that we use in the forecast, and then some of the other things that I just mentioned. And then the last thing I want to say uh, for those in the audience or anyone watching online is that this presentation, the economic forecast presentation, and all supporting documentation will be, or probably are already available on the budget agency website. Um, and that's it. Uh, if Ari has anything to add, he's the, the true expert uh, on all these uh, models that we do, but we're, we're happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Isn't uh, plus or minus 2% set by the committee as an acceptable standard of how your forecast will be viewed? Uh, well, I think nationally, and I've, I've been to a few conferences over the years where we talk about revenue forecasting, I think 2% is probably a national standard, at least from what I've heard at different, uh, different events about, you know, what are you really trying to get at? What's an acceptable margin of error on a forecast? Now, of course, when you're talking about 2%, you're on a $34 billion biennial revenue stream, you're talking about quite a bit of money one direction or the other. Could be high, could be low. I think historically we have been, I don't want to brag too much on the forecast committee, but I think this committee has historically been uh, well within that margin, sometimes under 1%, but it's, I, I would not say it's uncommon to be, you know, for the committee to be one to, 2% at the very high end uh, 
off in projections? Because looking at the, the past history was, you know, about 10 years ago, 2009, weren't we off more than 2 percent? Wasn't there, uh, yeah, there was, was there a total of about 3 billion that did not come into the state that year? Um, it was a pretty significant amount. If I remember right, I think the, and I'm not going to get the numbers, raw numbers, but I think we declined about 1.1 percent the first year as the recession was just starting to hit, and then when we felt the full brunt, it was another 5 to 6 percent decline in state revenue. Right. So maybe over the two years, we probably saw a dip of 7 percent below the so for recession. 10 years, seeing nothing but economic growth in these revised forecasts has been a little bit unusual um, because of the, the economy generally. This is the longest recovery on historical record at this point. Okay. Again, plus or minus 2% is still, I mean, we could potentially go down 1% next year and not because of unknown factors and still be yes, within sir. within our forecast. Yep, that would be true. Okay. Representative Porter. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, um, at the beginning of, of your presentation, you named six people that was part of this team that mm -hmm. worked on this the whole year and other years. Uh, so from my perspective, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a consensus by a nonpartisan group to, to have this, this uh, forecast, revenue forecast. So, I mean, if we, you're talking about playing with one or two percent, I'm, I'm, that's kind of perplexing to me. When he, we just heard from, from um, uh, Mr. Uh, Jackson that um, may not have recession until in the middle of 2020 uh, 20 or, you know, uh, 2021. Um, so I, I think, you know, to play with the one or two percent, I think it's, um, I, th I think I like to keep it where it is right now, uh, and I understand where, where you may be going. But I remember in '09, that was the Great Recession, also, and uh, so I, I'm just little, having a little pushback or a little a little pause in regards to your comment in regards to uh, dealing with that one two percent. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tallian. Thank you, um, Ben. I have a couple of questions. I just want to make sure that that. I've got all this right. So um, the the new numbers show us up um, 200. Oh, I meant uh, it's the 200 and yeah, 238 and then 291. But and that's not from the budget because some of the changes were incorporated. Wait, wait, I'm getting there. there. Okay. I'm getting there. I, all right. So that's up from the April forecast. And then you're saying that sort of, if I can put this in layman's terms, uh, we already included some of that money in the appropriations uh, anticip by, by basic estimates, That's right? That's true. That's right. All right. So, but still, the difference that we're left with, even after, just after that, the difference is still we're still up 125 million and 135 million even if right. you account for that. Right. right. Um, so we're still going to have an extra couple hundred million in the budget by the end of 21, right? According to the forecast. And okay. So according to the forecast. I hope we're perfect. Well, that's what we're going on. So, forecast, so yes. given that, I'm looking at the surplus statement now, um, and. And the surplus statement, when I get down to the bottom line, um, you seem to add that extra money in, um, but, but then uh, at the bottom, have you taken out $300 million? Uh, let, let me clarify that that's yeah. not a function of the Revenue Forecast Committee. That's a statement put out by the right. budget right. agency. So. Um, I, I direct those questions to to Director Jackson. Okay. We just, are we, we going to talk th about this separately, or we can we talk about this now? Okay. All right. Then I'll just. Sorry, Zach. I have a question for you. Um, so in the in the surplus statement, we've added the new money, right? Um, 
but the combined balances, I, I'm not quite getting this note at the bottom um, that says it doesn't include the $300 million uh, that we might take out of, uh, for, for, out of cash for capital projects. But we haven't done that yet. All right, so, so this combined balance, instead of being $2.369 billion, should actually be 2.6. Yeah, but we haven't done that yet. All right. All right, but that's not what this is showing, right? The 2.3, the 2.3 shows after we take out the 300 million. Wait, wait. So, wait. So, so I'm still a little bit confused about this. Is the combined balance 2.369 or is it 2.669? And that's and that and that's and and so if we take the governor's if we take that 300 million then the combined balance will be 2.069. Oh, okay, so we're not at 2.6, we're at 2.3, and, and we could be going to 2.0. Is that, okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I got, your, your note was not clear. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ben. I just had a question on uh, slide, thir well, that one. The cigarette tax I, I, revenue, I know, which is going down, I, I, uh, the updated I, forecast for 2019 or 2020, 2021 is, is down 2% and then 3.5% anticipated. All right? Did yeah, I read that right? Right. Correct. Okay. And that is that um, based on the supposition of raising the tobacco age to 21? No. So one, one thing to be very clear about the forecast, that's a Excellent point. The forecast is always based on the law that as it stands on the day of the forecast. So we never project any future law changes when we do the revenue forecast. And that gets back to the point about the April 17th forecast versus the budget plan forecast. Even though there were bills moving through the General Assembly that seemed fairly likely to pass, the forecast committee is always going to say, nope, the law stands as this today, and we're going to base all of our assumptions on how the law is today. So you are correct that if something were to pass at the federal level or at the state level, yes, that would impact our cigarette tax revenues in a way that is different from what is forecasted today. That's and what I thought. And I know in the past when that idea has been floated, there was a, a fiscal impact to that. Does anyone have a ballpark number from past um, what I, that was? Yeah, I'm sure LSA is, is working on something or, um, you know, the budget agency might, but I, I don't have a... So the point. numbers are going down here, the revenue, because we are seeing a decrease in smoking already? Uh, yes. Sales? Right. That's, yeah, that's a direct result of fewer packs sold uh, because the rate's the same. Right. And that's even without a significant increase. Okay, then does the... And I don't know this, um, but for the vape products now that are not cigarettes. Um, and actually, I don't know if we even tax these cigs. I should know that, but the same. But for the vape products, I don't think we do. For the vape products that don't have nicotine in them at all, is there any tax on that now? How does that work? Do you even know? So just uh, on, on vaping That's products, there is just a sales tax. All right, yeah, so then that would, be, that would be another uh, revenue hit if the proposal includes vape products since they're ubiquitous. I, to the extent that that proposal would lower the number of vaping products sold, that would impact our sales tax revenue. I do not know how much that would be. Okay. But yes, there theoretically could be an impact there. All right. Thank you. Senator Taylor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, going back to the statement the Chairman made earlier, in 2000, I believe it was 2009, fiscal year 2010, 
that we saw the decrease of, you said approximately a billion dollars, somewhere around 3%. Uh, well, I this, I'm just going off of memory. I think we dropped 1.1 percent. The first year as a recession was just start, starting in about 5 to 6 percent the next year. So a total peak to trough drop of probably 6 or 7 percent. But again, don't hold me to that. I am no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to hold you to exact numbers, ago. but I'm sure okay. the, the chairman probably was around then, and I know he was around. He was running things. I, I appreciate that. But did our did our balance reserve go up or down after that uh, our reserve what? balance went to almost zero the reserve balance our whole combined reserve balance yes okay and during the next year we right it did then the next year somehow it got replenished am i correct not in total. I mean, it, it took we, us a couple budget cycles to get back up. But part of that was a, was a reserve from, uh, was a payment, Medicaid payment, right? From uh, the federal, there was federal government? I mean, there was a billion dollars that came from the federal government to the state of Indiana. So when they saw, when we, when we saw when the when the recession was in place, the federal government did something to help fix it. Do we anticipate that to happen again if we were going to recession? Well, I, I know he has no problem increasing the deficit, so that's the twenty one trillion right now. So I, I would anticipate that that could be Considered, that's all I can tell you. The fact is that the deficit has gone up considerably uh, while we have a great economy. Um, but I'm just saying we, we got help from the feds, and then we didn't, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chairman, but we didn't give that help back to the taxpayers. It's in that reserve part of it. Still in that Medicaid reserve, 577. Well, we didn't raise taxes during the recession, and a lot of other states did. I, I, great job. I, I, I think that's a great thing to do. Not every state raised taxes, though. Uh, so we, we could take credit for that, pat ourselves on the back. But the reserve that we have today was not replenished through our budgetary process exclusively. It was replenished by a combination of our budgetary process in the federal government. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because sometimes when you take these statements in absolutes, Mr. Chairman, that we had a deficit of, I mean, we saw a, a, a decrease of 5% five, 5 we don't bring up the fact that that was made up by somebody other than us. And I just want to make sure that, the, that we understand that there's other factors that go in, come into play in that scenario. And I just wanted to bring that to our attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Tallian. Um, one more. Um, I, Zach, Zach uh, one more question on the, on the surplus statement. Um, there's an item here. It says capital line item projects for state agencies and universities. It's like 125. Uh, what is that? Can you explain what that means on here? Certainly. That's, that's meant to represent the um, when I, when I think about capital in the budget, there are four categories that we group that into. There is preventive maintenance, yeah. which we kind of consider that an ongoing cost. So preventive maintenance is built into just that that big appropriations line, like the the seventeen billion dollar line up above, since it's ongoing. Um, we have R and R, which there's always some sort of R and R going on, so we book that as part of the um, the the ongoing current year appropriation, and then there are uh, uh, debt service or lease rental payments. Those are ongoing. Those are part of that 17 billion as well. What's left over is what we view as one-time projects. Um, you know, one time we're going to build a state police lab, or or one time we're going to. Um, uh, give money to a university to, to build a new building. 
and, and th there can be a little bit of blurriness whether it's not something's one time or not, but, but we do our best to kind of, if, if, if it's funded in the budget as a line item project, then we score it as <laughs> one time and put those expenses below the line. It put, put them in this section. All so right, this is so meant to show that dollars going, one-time expenses going out the door to fund one-time university projects or one-time state agency projects. So all of the proje all the projects in that line are capital projects, uh, are all these cash-funded projects that were already appropriated in the budget? Uh, they are, are they, we, we ask that again, I just want to make sure. Are these all cash-funded projects? Correct, yes. And were, the, were all of these already appropriated in the budget, or are any of these the new projects that they, we're talking about? They are just new things done in the 2019 budget. But they were already in the budget as cash. They're not part of the, of oh, the, yeah, yeah. Of the programs that we want to change from bonding to cash. Correct. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. At this time, we're going to take about a 10-minute recess and come back and do the Medicaid uh, forecast and then power through the rest of the agenda. So about 10 minutes, stretch your legs. <laughs>